we're developing a strategy for our marriage, a game plan for our marriage. A game plan is important. It really is. If you don't have a game plan, you're going to end up with a Super Bowl like last Super Bowl. <laughs> Come on. So this is the worst Super Bowl I've seen in I don't know how long, man. Come, just get a get. Did you have a game plan? Was there any? Was just throw it to the back in the backfield. You've been doing it all year, man. It was bad. Obviously, no game plan. Don't get me started on the halftime, man. My goodness, garbage, garbage. Anyway, that's what happens when you don't have a game plan. You don't plan. So we're developing a game plan for our marriage. All right. Here's what Proverbs says. Proverbs chapter 21, verse five says, "Good planning and hard work." lead to prosperity. So when you got when you got a game plan for your marriage, it's going it, to man your marriage will prosper. That word means to be uh, it literally means to be on top of or ahead of. So your marriage will be with a good game plan, you're going to be on top of it, you're going to feel ahead of it in your marriage. But hasty shortcuts, when you think that a healthy marriage is just going to happen, it's not going to take work or or you know, worse yet, that you actually try to take shortcuts to happiness in your marriage, it leads to poverty. And poverty is the exact opposite of prosperity, where it's prosperity means to be in front of or above. Poverty means to be behind or beneath. Okay, so, so some marriages feel like that, maybe even today, where you feel, man, just kind of beneath it, under it, feeling the pressure of it, always behind, like you're not really caught up and can never catch up to it. Well, we need a game plan. You guys, last week we discussed the defensive game plan because we live in a very offensive world with an enemy who's strategizing, who's scheming, is a real game. He's got a game plan for you and for your marriage, and he's scheming at the drawing board constantly. So we need to develop a defensive game plan to resist the, the schemes and the tactics of the enemy. Today, what we're going to do is discuss an offensive game plan. Okay, so if you don't have an offensive game plan, you will develop an offensive relationship, okay? Meaning that you'll develop bitterness, uh, resentment. Uh, th that stuff will just chip away at the joy and the intimacy and, and all. Uh, it'll chip away at your marriage over time, the little offenses that build up just because we didn't have an offensive game plan. Let me give you two extra bonus scriptures. They're not in your notes. They're not even up here. I just want to give them to you, you guys, extra verses the first one will bring some excitement to the man. If we have any men in the place, let me hear a grunt. Okay, no men. Men, can I hear a grunt? Is there any guys? Okay, there you go. It's not like you're coughing something up, man. We're going to work on that, you guys. Proverbs 27, 15 says, A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. And all the men said, Oh, man. Oh, someone took the bait. Someone did. You almost had it, man. You just did not have amen that, bro. Hopefully your wife is not, is not here or you're not married. Um, okay, ladies, I'm not leaving you out. Here's, for, here's a scripture for you guys, okay? It's better to have severe hemorrhoids than to live with a husband who's a jerk. <laughs> and all the ladies said, amen. amen. If you're wondering, where's that? That's in 2 Jason chapter 4, verse 2. That's... <laughs> Where's that, Pastor? I just can't find that in my Bible. It's me. I made it up, okay? Um, if you've developed, though, it, maybe some offenses already in your marriage, in your relationship, if, if, there's, if you're at each other, okay, then, then I, I guarantee you one of three things are happening, okay? I'm going to give you these, these offensive relationships and why we kind of develop offenses in relationships. I want to give you these three kind of culprits or reasons why, and then we're going to get an offensive game plan. I'm going to show you that today, and they really fly against culture once again, but let's take some notes. I really want to expose this together because you may be here today, and there has been some bitterness, maybe some resentment, some things, some offenses have built up. Three different reasons why that happens. Here's the first one. Number one is we're fighting the wrong enemy. Okay, if there is offenses in this marriage, if there's, if there's resentment and all these things that are, I, I guarantee that one of the reasons is because you're fighting the wrong enemy and your spouse is not your enemy. Your spouse isn't even the problem. The devil wants you to believe that. The devil wants you to believe that your spouse is the problem because as long as you do believe that, you'll never fix you never spend any energy or time fixing the real problem because we don't, we don't want to admit that it's our own selfishness that's the problem, that it's our pride or our own issues are actually the problem. Ultimately, you need to understand your spouse is not the problem. Your spouse is not the enemy. Here's what Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says. For we don't wrestle against flesh 
in blood. That's not my, I don't, I, don't, I don't fight there. That's not my enemy. We actually are against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's where the battle is. That's where your enemy is. We're fighting the wrong enemy, and we build up offenses because of it. All right, here's the second reason, and that is we are driven by wrong motives. Got the wrong motives driving us, man. That's where. That's why we kind of develop offenses in relationship. Maybe we. You, you want to be right. That's your motivation. You just want to be right. Or maybe you want to win. You need to win, and you need to always win the argument, win the day, whatever it is. Or maybe your motivation is to change him, to change her, change their attitude, change their habits, change their behavior, make them more like you, see like you, think like you, all that stuff. It's the wrong motivation. If you have that mode, any of these wrong, false motivations, it's going to create offenses. Here's the pure motivation, 2 Corinthians 5.14. For those of you that are in Christ, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. Hey, what's motivating your marriage today? What is, what's fueling it? What is, what is the motivation? Okay, or, or let's even say of that last argument, of that last fight, what was motivating you to put a stake in the ground? What motivated you to raise your voice? What motivated that, that fight? Was it, I guarantee, if there's offenses built up, it wasn't because Christ's love was fueling you. It wasn't Christ's love that was motivating us because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for us. So we're using these wrong motives. And then lastly, if there's offenses built up, it, it could be quite possibly we're using the wrong tactics. We're using the wrong tactics. Psychologist and researcher John Gottman studied marriage for 16 years, and, and he would sit with a married couple for five minutes during an argument, during an altercation, and he was able to determine with 91% accuracy if that married couple was going to divorce in the future. 91%, okay? And it wasn't that, it, it wasn't if a fight happened or an argument happened, because you're, you're married, you're going to fight, you're going to have arguments, you're going to have quarrels and scuffs and stuff like that. It wasn't if they fought, it was how they fought. It was the tactics that they used. What tactics did they use on each other as they fought and as they argued? He was able to determine if this marriage was going to succeed or not. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, actually tells us what kind of tactics we're gonna, we should use. Because although we live in this natural realm, we don't wage war. We don't fight in the natural realm. See, your marriage is not... See, the problem is a lot of you think your marriage is a natural thing. It's just a physical thing. It's a natural thing. And you think you have natural problems. You don't have natural. That's, you keep applying natural solutions. You don't have a natural marriage. You have a spiritual union. You are spirit beings. And for spirit problems, you need spiritual solutions. He says, we don't wage war like the world does, employing you know, human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, he says, our spiritual weapons are energized, well, this is what you need, divine power. You don't need, you don't need more intellect, more self-help books, more, you need divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses of the enemy. But we're using the wrong tactics. Your marriage is not a physical or even a natural union. It is a spiritual one, and spiritual problems need spiritual solutions. So instead of settling for the, the relationship filled with offenses and hurts, where we're fighting each other instead of lifting each other up, where we're driven by selfish motives instead of the love of Christ, instead of piling up offenses, what we need, you guys, is an offensive game plan. We need an offensive game plan. And sadly, we just don't have a lot of examples of what a godly marriage looks like today, do we? It's just, it's, you know, they're, they're more and more rare. In, in, in fact, there's... in there's a TV show called Modern Family like, that kind of talk, it just is a, is a picture of what modern family and modern marriage looks like. And sadly, a lot of, a lot of you know, what they show is just flies in the face. It really does. It's counterculture or counter to what God's principles and word is. And if you want to have a healthy marriage, if you want to have a biblical, a godly, a great, a lasting marriage, at least God's way, then you can't look to, I believe you can't look to modern the modern world, you got to go back to something further. You got to go back to an ancient path. You got to go back to God's value system. 
if you want to have marriage God's way, a healthy, a happy, a forever marriage. Look at this scripture I found, Jeremiah chapter 6. This is what the Lord says. Stand, you're standing at the crossroads, and you have God's word that pastor is preaching, and you got the world's way that everyone says is right. They're doing it that way. Everyone's following in it. But, but you need to look and ask for the ancient past. Some of you need to, don't look to the modern, the modern translation, the modern world. You need to go back to the values of your grandparents. You need to go back to, to, to the God's value system. And even if it's countercultural or not popular, we get to this place where we say, I don't care what you think about it. I am going to look for the ancient path and ask where the good way is. That's what I'm going to look for. And I'm going to walk in it. And you will find, look at this, rest for your souls. See, this modern world cannot give you what your soul needs. Rest for your soul is found in an ancient hey, your soul needs something that's found in an ancient path, in an ancient way. We need to get back to this ancient path of marriage. So I want to give you six culture-busting principles of marriage, okay? This is part of your, this is your offensive game plan for marriage, six culture-busting principles that go against today's norms. Take some notes, you guys. Here's your offensive game plan for your marriage or maybe your future, future marriage. Number one is hurry home. Hurry home. Don't, don't stay out late. Don't work late. Don't get another job. Don't keep. Hurry home. This is so essential for marriage it, to make time together a priority. And in order for that to happen, you ought to write down extra in the notes somewhere, okay? Schedules have to change. Schedules have to change. Our priorities have to change. There's, there is not enough time for everything in your schedule. There isn't. There, somebody, please listen, somebody is going to feel left out. It's going to happen. Someone is going to feel neglected. Someone is going to feel cheated. The real question isn't, are you you know, cheating? That's not the question. The real question is, who are you cheating? Because someone's going to feel cheated. There's not enough time to please everybody, to do everything. Someone is going to feel neglected. Someone's going to feel left out. Someone's going to feel cheated. And it, it, it better not be your spouse. It better not be her. It better not be him. I'd rather neglect work, neglect success, neglect, neglect all that for success in the home, okay? There's not enough time. It's time to get back to an ancient path and stop, stop the whole you know, ships passing in the night where everybody, some families, everybody's on different schedules. Every kid has their different schedule. Mom and dad has different schedules. It's just time to get back and make time together a priority. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, love does not demand its own way. It doesn't demand its own way. We need, we need to kind of... Let go of some things to pull some important people closer, okay? Let go. Even if they're good things, they may even be important things. There's more important things, okay? Hurry home. It goes against the norm of culture, but we need to get back to the ancient path. That's a part of our offensive game plan. Here's number two, and that is to cultivate communication. Cultivate communication. We got to work at this. We got to work hard at understanding and seeking to understand one another. I mean, communication is so it's paramount to a healthy marriage. It's so important to the offensive game plan. The problem is the average couple in America only speaks to each other four minutes a day. Four. This is a problem. You guys, it's a problem. We spend four hours on our phones and four minutes talking to our spouse, and it's usually to exchange words that you should have never spoke, Okay. All right, Psalm, uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 17 says this. It says, a wicked messenger falls into trouble. And that's, we fall into this pattern. The only time we speak to each other, we've got a problem. We've got a criticism. We've got neg something negative to say. Be careful. They'll become what you speak over them. You better be careful. A trustworthy envoy brings healing. When you, when you can be trusted by your spouse to bring healing and to bring life and to bring words of affirmation, cultivating communication is so important to a healthy game plan, but you have to, you have to understand how, how, that men and women, we communicate differently. We communicate differently. We think differently. Men are, women are great talkers. Men are not traditionally. Okay. So 
women speak 30,000 words a day. Men speak 15,000 words a day. I usually spend all my words during the day. Veronica saves up all her words and comes home with them. Help me, Jesus, <laughs> right? Amen. Pastor Jeremy had a great illustration last night for Unity, didn't you? How many of you guys enjoyed Unity Marriage Conference last night? It was so fun, man. A really great experience. Pastor Jeremy gave this illustration of, because you, you have to understand how we communicate and think differently as men and women in order to cultivate communication because we're not on the same page. We're just, we're just not. So, so he had this illustration. He had these two boxes, and inside one of the boxes was the man's mind. This is how the man's mind looks. This is how the woman's m- mind looks. And inside the men's box, their mind, he pulled out all these little boxes. And so men think compartmentalized. They, they only think in one box at a time. So we have a box for our career. We have a box for money. We have a box for our hobby. We have a, we have a box for sex. We have a box for all these, all these different things. And we only, you know, we our minds only go to one box at a time. And women are totally different. There was like, he pulled out rope. There's all this rope. And he's, he said, they're all, it's all interconnected. The way that we think, uh, women think is connect. They connect everything. Everything is connected. All the people, circumstances, situations all connect to each other. Just think differently. So women, I want to help you out. The re- so when you ask your, your husband, how was work today? You put him in his work box. And so <laughs> when men, when they communicate, it's bottom line. Women like to give details. <laughs> Men are bottom line. Women are details. So when you say, how was work today? He got in his work box and he said, it was fine. <laughs> you know why? Because it was fine. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Nothing really happened today. It was, just, it was just work. It was work. It was fine. Okay. That's, that's, that's all you're going to get. You got to, if you want him, if you want a little bit more, you got to help, help a brother out, okay? Open some more boxes up. Ask some more questions about the other boxes in his life because his mind doesn't work the way your mind does. You know, you got to speak to him like you speak to your kids. That's just the way it is, okay? So when I, when I speak to my kids, I ask my kids, how was your day? So they'll say, it was fine. Every, they'll do it. Actually, one of my kids, every time, every time I ask her how her day was, she says, mediocre. For years, she's done this. I'm like, we prayed for a good day. Come on. Mediocre. So what I got to do is I got I to ask a different question, right? So it wasn't, and this actually happened just this last week. I said, wasn't it spirit day? You had a bunch of spirit bucks. What'd you use those bucks on? Oh, yeah, I did this. And now she opens up and stuff. And, and you got you to talk to him. Different Women t- are totally different. They're not going to give you just the, the one answer. You ask a woman, how was your day? She's going to tell you in detail how her day was. It was a great day. I actually had that presentation today, and you know I was stressed out about that presentation. I've been studying for that presentation for weeks now. When I gave that presentation, it was that one paragraph. That one paragraph, you know I was stressed about that paragraph. But I saw everyone's faces. They lit up, and I felt so affirmed in my womanhood and my leadership because you know leadership as a woman is hard. And when Rachel Ray was talking last week, she was talking about this, but she was making that Rosetto. Remember that Rosetto? I made it. Should I make that next week? I'll make some Rosetto next week because your mom's coming over and your mom and where are you? I can't, and guys can't follow. Our minds don't do that. We're like, what box are you in? This is why, this is why the guys glaze over when you're talking. You think, you think like, oh, weren't you listening to me? He's trying, I promise. He is trying to keep up with you, which my wife, she'll go into like, she'll start using these, these different descriptors for people, but she's on to like the fourth person. So she's like, and then she said, and he said, and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. you this is the like fourth conversation. Who's he? Who's she? I'm lost. What's happening right now? Cause everything is, everything is connected. We found out. I actually, I asked on Facebook, um, you know, what this last yesterday, last night, what was like your, your big takeaway from, and one person said, I didn't know that men actually had a nothing box. <laughs> and she said, this solves the 30 year mystery in my marriage. You know, and I'm telling you, like, this is a true, a real thing. They actually put probes on guys' brain. They put dude in a room with like a TV and stuff. And he, listen, this is a real, he almost went brain dead. (laughs) Men have this, this ability to just go nowhere. (laughs) 
and do and nothing, nothing. So I hope that helps you ladies. I really do. You shouldn't get angry at them for being a dude and being a guy and thinking about nothing. Okay. He just thinks, don't get angry at him. It should lead you to sympathize for the, like, oh, <laughs> poor guy. Poor numbskull. He's trying. He's trying. Would you like me to repeat that? I'm going to repeat that for you. Okay. Well, man, I'm going to help you out here. Um, I'm going to give you the four most romantic words you can say. When you feel, especially when you're feeling a little bit lost in the conversation, don't, don't, argue, don't be like, where are you? I'm not, and get, don't get, I used to do that, but I learned these four words. You ought to write these four words down. It will save your life. Dude, I'm help, helping you out. Here it is, okay? Four most romantic words. And then what happened? <laughs> Just... Because she's got that rope and it's going everywhere. Don't, try, don't even try to follow it, okay? Just let her keep pulling on the rope until she gets to the end. And then what happened? And then what happened? Oh, yeah, and then what happened? Just let her get to the end of the rope, man, I'm telling you. That's, uh, <laughs> I hope I'm helping you out today, okay? <laughs> Cultivate communication. You got to work at it. You got to know you're different, but you got to work at it. Okay, here's the third part of our offensive game plan. It's a culture buster, and that is nourish romance. Nourish romance romance. You know, the last time you heard your wife say, honey, lock the door, turn off the lights, is when your parents were pulling up in the driveway, man. That was funny. Come on, I don't care what you say. That was funny. Without, without romance, though, and sex, marriage is reduced to like a business transaction, a business relationship. We're just two people living in the same house, under the same roof, you know, living two separate lives. Listen, guys, romance is not a luxury. Oh, we don't have time for romance. You better make time for romance or you might not have a marriage. We got to look, we got to get back to the ancient path here and bring romance back into our lives and into our marriage. Proverbs 5 says it like this, rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be captivated by her love. That word captivated is the same word for intoxicated. What he's saying is, hey, may you forever be giddy over her. May you forever just be so captivated and giddy and intoxicated by her love. I'm telling you, God can put your marriage back to that place. He can. But there are some, there are some romance killers in our society and in our culture. I want to I give you three. They're not in your notes. I'm just, we're having fun today, man. We're gonna, I'm going to give you three romance killers and three romance boosters today if you want to take some extra notes, okay? Romance, some romance killers in our culture today, number one, is digital distractions, digital distractions. Get off your phone. Put it away. Get off the computer. Put it, put it away, man. Get back to FaceTime. Not FaceTime, iPhone. FaceTime. Some real face-to-face -face time. This kills, it kills communication and cultivating communication to be able to have romance. You need that. You got to get away with the digital distractions. The second romance killer in our culture today, huge, is pornography. Pornography is, it, I mean, it's just not guys either. The statistics, uh, women are almost equal to the, the amount of guys who are looking at regularly pornography. And sometimes it's not even for like, you know, uh, seemingly, at least in our modern world, seemingly bad reasons. We watch it together. It helps us. We have fun. And, or, or as long as, you know, they don't mind, she don't mind, he don't mind. As long as, you know, I just, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal. It's not a habit, you know. And, and I'm telling you, it's a big deal. It is a romance. It's a romance killer. It will destroy the fabric of your romance. It creates, uh, among many things, an unhealthy and unrealistic expectation. It don't work that way. I'm telling you, that it does not work that way, all right? It's, it, that scenario will never happen. That don't even real body parts, man. It don't bend like that. It don't happen like that. It ain't ever, it's unrealistic. That's not real life, and it's scary. The reason why it's so unhealthy, too, is because what pornography does is it removes the human element from what's supposed to be an intimate relationship between husband and and wife, and it removes that. It makes it selfish and self gratifying. And anytime, even if you say, "Well, we do it together," you, the Hebrews says, "Do not do not defile your marriage bed. You defile the marriage bed whenever you bring outside entities into that. An outside person into that marriage bed was never supposed to belong. That's supposed to be between husband and wife. It's a romance killer. 
Okay, trust me, it's, not, it's, it's, it's ancient, I get it, but you need to get back to the ancient path, okay? It's digital distractions and pornography. The third one is, you may not think it is a romance killer, but it is, negative friends. Negative friends. So if you're married, if you're married, you need to get around other married couples who, are act, who, have, who have a game plan for their marriage. They're actually investing into each other. They have a defensive game plan, offensive ga- game plan, and they're, they love each other and they nourish the romance with each other because you will become like who you spend time with. And if you continue to spend time with people who are pulling the guy this way, pulling the girl this way, and they're not investing into each other, you will become like those people. So if you're married today, you need to get around some people who honor and value each other and their marriage as a priority. Can I get an amen? Okay, get into a married small group or just get some friends that are married, something to nourish the romance. Okay, here's some romance boosters. And, and there are some really, um, there's some really, uh, there's a lot of good truth in some popular romance songs today. So what I, what I want to do is I want to teach this in a way that you'll remember it, these romance boosters. I'm going to use some, some songs to help me teach this. Okay, so here's the first sing along. Here's the first romance booster. There you go. Okay. So, so what you want to do, here's the first romance verse. Reaffirm your love for her often. For your love for him, let them know. Like every time you part ways, you should reaffirm your love. Every time you part ways, you should say, I, you should communicate your love. You should remind them of your love. Remind her of her beauty. Remind him of, of how, much, how much you enjoy him. Reaffirm that they're your one and only right? Men, ask her to marry you again. Women, say yes. Okay? All right. Here's the second. Here's the second romance booster. All right. So women, women need to be loved. Men communicate love by respect. So when you respect a man, that's how he usually receives Love when he is respected. So women, I'm, I'm helping you out in this message, I hope. Women, you, you can respect him by following his leadership, by letting him make some decisions. The, the king doctrine. The king doctrine says when you treat him like a king, he'll treat you like a, like a queen. And what, what really eats away at the respect in, in marriage is, is what I call over-familiarity. Okay, and I'm not saying like to hide stuff. No, it's not, I'm not. Familiarity is a good thing to, to have everything open and honest in your, in your marriage. It should be. But over-familiarity is entitlement. It's where we're together for so long, we get to this place of comfort and over-familiarity that we don't even say thank you anymore. I just, it's just because I'm married. We're married. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to clean that. You're supposed to have sex with me. You're supposed, you're just, you're, you, so you leave the bathroom door open. You do little things that you should not do. You should, what we need, what we need is some R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Just a little bit. Amen? We need some respect back into our, and when people, you, maybe you've said or you've heard where they say, man, I wish we can get back to the place we used to be in our marriage. They're not, it's not usually like, oh, where we used, like sex or anything like that. They're talking about, this, man, because you used to honor me more. You used to respect me more. You used to communicate to me differently. You used to have gratitude. and You used to just hold, hold this relationship differently. You don't hold it the same respect. It's, it's a romance booster when you, can, when you can give respect to your partner, to your spouse. All right, here's the third romance booster. Sing it if you know it. Okay, you know a man wrote that song, right? <laughs> right? Let's get it on. When has that ever worked for you? Right, guy? You know what I mean? So, men, can I tell you, that works for Marvin Gaye. That don't work for you. You know what I mean? You got to work on your approach, guy. Like, we think that, you know, if we strip down or something, or if we just say, let's get it on, you know, that it, it ain't working, man. You need to come with something a bit smoother than Marvin Gaye, okay? But ladies, ladies. Exact opposite. This works for you every time. It don't matter. It doesn't matter how you even say it. It doesn't matter. You could say it casually. Let's get it on. Men, is that going to work or what? Come on now. That's going to work. You can say it as a question. Let's get it on. 
Yeah, 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 that's good. Okay, you can say it as like the, the solution, the answer to a problem. Let's get it on. <laughs> yes, it works. I'm telling you, it works. So here, check this out. Men, m- smooth, soften your approach. Ladies, make an approach. Just make it. Make it. It's a romance. You need it. You do need this in your, in your marriage. And if you're thinking like, man, how do I, it hasn't been romantic for so long. How do I, how do we, get, look, in order to get what you once had, you need to start doing again what you once did. Okay, you used to be captivated and giddy over, and God can do that again. You just, in order to get back to that place, you need to start doing what you once did. And some of you are waiting for the feeling to happen again. And sometimes you just need to do it. You just need to, do, you just need to get it on. Okay, somebody amen. Okay, all right. Uh, let me continue. Here's number four. Give me some, I'm help. Amen, guys. Am I helping you today? Let's go. Here's number four. Offensive game plan is celebrate differences. This is one that flies in the face of culture. Def- it's, we're, not, we're, we're not honoring the differences of the sexes. We're trying to blend the sexes. Like, no, we can do everything. You, you were created different by design. You're different by design. It's, it's, and so we hear things like, oh, we're just not compatible. Just not compatible. Of course you're not compatible. He's got a guy's brain, you got a girl's brain, you got different personalities, different gifts, different interests, all that stuff. You can either let those differences divide you or let those differences complement you, okay? You're, you're different by design. So when a woman says, I got nothing to wear, what she's saying is, I need another outfit. She's really not saying she ain't got nothing to wear. It's there. It's all, it's the closet's full, the drawers are full. But when a guy says, I got nothing to wear. What he's saying is, I haven't done laundry, right? <laughs> We're different. It's different by design. You, you need to learn how to celebrate your differences. Stop trying to change your mate, your partner, your spouse. Stop trying to change them and make them more like, like you. Make them more like, like a woman or like a man. You got to understand that, that your man, what motivates him, what motivates men is achievement. We have warrior spirits. Don't crush that. Don't belittle that. Don't, don't belittle his warrior spirit. He needs to accomplish things. Let him accomplish things. Okay, let him, let him you know, have the map quest, map quest. Let him do the directions. But man, when you get lost, let her help you, okay? C- celebrate the, the differences that you guys have. Don't, don't let them compete. Let them complement each other. Because Mark 3, 25 says, If a house divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I mean, yes, you, 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 just because you're different doesn't mean you have to divide. Amen. It doesn't. You can let it complement. That's how God designed it. God designed us to complement one another. Here's number five is finish together. And this one is a culture buster because more and more people are leaving divorce as an option on the table. And listen to me, your marriage needs security. Your spouse needs to have security in the relationship that no matter what, we're going to get through it together. That we're in this. We're going to get through it together to finish together. My definition of marriage is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. I love that. It's unconditional commitment to an imperfect person person. I gave you guys um, a definition of commitment during unity. It it bears worth repeating here. Commitment is being willing to be unhappy until we work it out. That's what, that's what commitment says. And culture says, stick up for yourself. Oh no, you have a right to be happy, but God says, honor your covenant commitment. Even when it's painful, even when it's hard. And I'm telling you, you can never build a great marriage as long as divorce is an option. You got to take that option. You got to give your spouse security and honor the covenant relationship. Okay, here's the final culture blessing principle in your marriage, and that is to trust God. Trust God. There was uh, not too long ago, some years ago, a, a couple came into my office, a married couple. They were, they were experiencing a lot of trouble, and what they had done is they had written out a list of their issues. And, and the husband pulled it out, you know, opened up this paper and began to, there was, must have been like 30 of them. And it went on and on and on. As I'm listening to him, I'm getting like, 
like, like wow, de- depressed myself, but thinking like this is a, like they, I could sense their hopelessness that they had. And even a lot of their issues that they were explaining were legitimate r- reasons of conflict. And you could tell they were not happy with each other. There's a lot of anger and, and resentment. And as they were going on, I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to help these, this couple solve these issues? So he goes on and on. And then at the end, the husband hands me, like, here you go, help us. And I take this thing, and I look down at the paper, I look at the couple, I look at the paper, and I, I was facing that moment, like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go through this list with them and just kind of help just navigate through some of the, you know, give solution and wisdom and help them with this, or, or am I going to get to the heart of this problem? What I did there is I looked at them, looked at the list, and I ripped the list. And it shocked them. They, they were, and I leaned into them, and I said, you guys, I... I'm not going to I'm not going to even attempt to go over this list you gave me although it's legitimate because at the heart of what really is the problem is you need a spiritual foundation for your marriage. We didn't ha- they didn't have this trust God. They they were not trusting God in their relationship. So I said, look, what you need cuz I could I could go through these these this list of things and we can go through one at a time and tackle each one of them, apply solutions. And I promise you, even if you were to solve these 30 things on here, you'll be back next year with a replacement 30. Because it's not going to work. It will not work unless what you need is to get God's perspective for your life and for your marriage. You need a spiritual foundation and God's power in order for this to work. Because unless the Lord builds the house... It's all in vain. It doesn't matter. It, it, it does not matter how many solutions, how many, as things crop up their head and you handle it and fix it. If you don't have a relationship with God and God's perspective on your marriage, or if you're not doing it God's way, I promise you, you'll get another list. It'll come up again, it'll happen again, and it just it doesn't. All this, you guys, this game plan, this, this marriage thing, it, doesn't, it does not work without God. It doesn't work. It wasn't designed to work without God. And I'd like to start right there with us. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes?